You will never contribute to an organization that will give you a higher probability of having your good intentions turn into real positive changes in other people's lives. That will give you a better chance than what you've done here tonight. His single biggest speech payday came from the Swedish telecom company Ericsson. And it's a very, very unusual and troubling story. Now, Ericsson is a Swedish telecom company that in 2009 and 2010 was in trouble with Hillary Clinton's State Department because Ericsson was selling a lot of telecom equipment to Iran, to Belarus, and to other oppressive governments about which the State Department was concerned. Ericsson risked being put on a list by the federal government in the United States for trading with an enemy state. There was actually an effort being put forward in Washington to broaden Iranian sanctions to include the very technologies that Ericsson was selling to the Iranian government. So it's against this background that Ericsson decided now might be a good time to hire Bill Clinton to give a speech. They had never paid for a speech by him before, and they decided to go in big, $750,000 for a single speech. Seven days after he gave that speech, Hillary's State Department came out with a statement which said, we are not going to broaden sanctions on Iran to include technologies like telecom. We're going to rely and expect companies like Ericsson to police themselves. It was a massive win for Ericsson. Ericsson was able to avoid having to deal with a regulatory battle in Washington, giving up contracts that were highly lucrative in these countries, and being put on a list that would create an enormous diplomatic problem for them all because essentially they paid Bill Clinton to give a speech for $750,000. Will you continue to give speeches? Oh yeah, I, I gotta pay our bills. Welcome to another episode of The Professor's Record. My name is David Clements, and today I'm joined by Michael Corey. Michael and I had the opportunity to meet one another back in Arizona during the protests um, over the November 8th election. I didn't really know who Michael was other than uh, he was keeping much of the same company I was, patriots like Joel Oltman and others, very concerned about the future of our country. And as I talked to Michael, I think we were standing in line uh, trying to get into the Maricopa uh, certification hearing. He started to ask me about my knowledge of the Erickson report, and um, I was a bit ashamed to, to realize I knew very little about his work. And so we're going to uh, make amends for that. So Michael, right out the gate welcome but i want to thank you for having me what is the erickson report so the erickson report it really is a culmination of my life um in 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 back and forth between lebanon and america Um, i'm a lebanese american citizen and growing up in detroit dearborn area uh, once i had seen 9 11 having had the opportunity to be spending summers in lebanon having neighbors that are um, of Islamic culture, having neighbors that are, uh, you know, Jewish, um, reading each other's texts, you know, the uh, Torah, the Hadith, um, understanding, wow, you know, a a lot of our cultures are very similar. And then having that moment of 9-11 kind of shred our, uh, you know, our faith um, so much because it felt like this, this doesn't, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't feel right. Uh, because you know, over here in Lebanon, we're we all get along, even when they're dropping bombs, you know, on on the country. Everyone is still enjoying and having the best of times that they can have, because they're very much uh, proud people. Um, and the the idea is to you know, very stubborn, but uh, very proud. Um, but but the idea is to you know, continue on with your life and be happy um, with what you have, right? The, th- be thankful for every day. Um, so, so that, that culminates as, as the war started to progress. And as I was stuck over there on on a few occasions, on a few summers, um, I was noticing that the government, along with when we were traveling to Syria, um, along with traveling, uh, to Jordan, we'd noticed that the governments were giving out, uh, Nokia and Ericsson cell phones, almost like, uh, two, three, four of them, like, like my uncle would have like four different Nokia or Ericsson cell phones. And I'd be like, you know, that's 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 strange like what, what why do they give you those and he would always tell me you know they they, they give you the phone but uh but the service changes so you have to you know you got to have different phones because certain cell towers are working during sometimes of the day and other cell towers are working during other times of the day and i just 
I was like, well, that's weird in America. You know, you, my dad's cell phone works all the time. <laughs> like there's no issues. Um, so once I'd come to, you know, stay, stay in the United States, had my education there, I went to the University of Michigan. Um, I started to get into, I, I immediately left University of Michigan and went into mortgage banking, uh, went to a company called Quicken Loans. Um, eventually, while being there, I, I worked on their um, <clears throat> lead portability system. So that's how the internal leads are, are basically delved out to the bankers to be able to take the, the deals and, and uh, help the client out, Does that, if that makes sense. Um, so I worked, first I was doing mortgage banking, but then because they saw that I had such an IT mind, um, <clears throat> they, uh, they assigned, I identified a problem that they had. Um, I, I brought it all the way up to the president CEO, Dan Gilbert, and I explained to him, you know, I've conducted all this research off hours, um, you know, on my own time. Um, and, and what I've come to the conclusion of is that you're wasting $53 million year over year on leads that are not being allowed to go to the proper banker uh, because the, the top tier banker or the best banker leaves at around two or three o'clock, right? So when there's only the lower tier bankers working extra hours and working late when you have those very expensive exclusive leads that are sometimes a thousand up to fifteen hundred dollars a pop those leads are not not being allowed to go to the higher tiered bankers so when i identified that problem um you know they they made a huge uh fuss of it and you know tried tried to put a huge uh, fat head of me on the wall and you know, I said, no, 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 I, I don't do, <laughs> I don't do that. Uh, you know, I, I'll just, I'll just take the monetary, uh, you know, benefit, which uh, was, you know, a certain percentage year over year. Um, what I, what I'd come to find out through my corporate lesson was when they gave me the keys to the IT side of things, and then I moved over to the banking side of things and learned everything. Uh, they never took away that token. Uh, so I'd always had a vice and they accidentally gave me a token for way too much access. So the best way to put it is I looked under the hood of the Ferrari and found that there was no engine. Okay. So let me, uh, let me see if I can connect some dots here. We've got um, a journey of someone that has dual citizenship between yep. Lebanon and, and U S citizenship. Um a questioning mind because of the narratives that were being set forth 9-11 and post 9-11. And I think most Americans now can have this conversation because there's so much we've discovered about the lies that were told to all of us in 9-11. But if you, you weren't someone from the Middle East, um, you weren't, you didn't have to examine things uh, the same way because, Hey, if you're living in, you know, main street America and you're not from the Middle East, um, it was really easy. And I think for people that are old enough to remember the times where, you know, it was really easy to, to, to identify the enemy, right? You, you oh, look, yeah. at look at Hollywood, look at the movies that were, were made at the time. Um, and you mentioned access to Ericsson phones or Nokia phones as something that was there on the ground. And through a bunch of different events, you come back, you're educated, you have a working knowledge of IT, you're working in a, a kind of the, you know, the epicenter of finance, high finance, and you're given backdoor access to the IT world. And so, I mean, this is, it's clear to me that there's a providential path that's been set forth for you to, to, to not only pay attention to the world around you, but now you have access to something, um, in part because of, of your competence, right? You basically were able to identify problems for a client, save a ton of money. And someone said, maybe not knowing what you're going to do with it, Michael, uh, help us clean up house a little bit. So here we are. Um, you finally are able to, you know, maybe not on purpose, but open the hood, as you say. What did you find that was of interest to you once you open the hood uh fraud beyond belief um they have everything set up in a way where you create a new overlay or a new version of the company 
And what's left underneath is the old mortgage bond. And <clears throat> so if, if you're creating just trusted third parties, and I don't want to get too uh, in the weeds, but imagine it, uh, you have a corporation, right? It's soulless. So if you take and offset your assets onto that soulless corporation, and you have it registered, say, in the Cayman Islands, you don't actually have to go to the Cayman Islands or give them any of your information. You just need to know one of these agents who is willing to, you know, and, and this is down there, this is commonplace, all the, you know, all the wealthy, this, this is, this is how the world really works. So, um, so what, what year was this uh, when, when you're basically given access to the back end of, of things that normally you just wouldn't have access to? 2013, 2014. 2013, 2014. Um, now, I'm still waiting for you to perhaps shine a light on what this has to do with Ericsson. If we could maybe uh, tighten that up and then uh, take us from there. What What is it about referring to your report as the Ericsson report? Um, what What was it in your research that that brought you home back to this idea of Ericsson being important? Right. So, so in the very early on, what I was seeing on the back end were these SWIFT transactions that were moving money. And SWIFT is created by uh, someone from the Wallenberg family, a friend of the Wallenberg family. That's usually a word for it. We're not associated with them, but really they are. Um, and SWIFT, so SWIFT is created by the Swedes and Ericsson is a Swedish company. Um, so a lot of the fuss that's been going on over Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks cables has a lot more to do with propriety and a lot more to do with these SWIFT transactions that the uh, CIA, the uh, M MI6 and black operations um, intelligence agencies around the world utilize to hide their SWIFT banking transactions along with the data that they send through those lines. Oh, hello. Can I please speak to you, Hillary Clinton? Um, I'm calling from the office of Julian Assange. It's very important. All of the US Department of State cables, we have intelligence that they are about to be put on the web, unredacted, not by us. This is an emergency. But when I say they're about to go, they are about to go. I don't think we have very long, so. Just put him on. Who is he? Who is he? OK, let me put him on the phone to you. Hold on a moment. He's the senior watch officer. You won't give me his name. Hello, who am I speaking to, please? Uh, g'day, 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 Chad. This is Julian Assange. Um, I would like to speak to the most senior person available who can execute an action quickly to send someone to location here uh, in Norfolk where we can discuss details that cannot be discussed over the phone. Uh, to try and to make it clear, we don't have a problem, you have a problem. So when I saw Ericsson involved in that aspect of the mortgage industry, and then I realized through John Durham's investigation that there was a highlight in a, in a hyperemphasis on a conglomerate of characters and i'm and i've uh sent you a few images that you can pull, put up when you see just how big this crime scene is and that's actually not the the full scope of all the people involved but to get to the point ericsson is a telecommunications inner exchange company so when edward snowden came out and put put out his leaks on the telecoms that actually was an internal uh obfuscation. I don't want to say what Snowden himself, well, I don't want to say what his intentions truly were, but he had the documents he was looking to disclose in December of 2012. And uh, in January, you had Obama already passing, uh, you know, immunity uh, executive orders for these telecommunications companies. So well, like four to five, six months before Snowden even puts his leaks out, Obama's already set up and put in place these working groups to basically take the NSA and strip it. Uh, because if you think about it, the NSA is our, is our hub of receipts. 
for data. So while people don't like the fact that, you know, you, you're being spied upon, um, the NSA at least does it in a form and fashion where the data flows to them. And then if they need that data based on police or uh, based on FBI or intelligence queries, then they'll pull it, right? It's much different from coming very in the early aspect of it where the cia has installed their assets and where mi6 has installed their assets so to get to the point in 20 february of 2022 ericsson comes out and their ceo admits through internal investigation that was leaked that they've been bribing funding sponsoring and supporting isis for a period of over 17 years now that should be alarming enough, you know, just to hear, oh man, a corporation supporting ISIS, that's, that's kind of scary, but it gets 10 times worse when you come to the realization that Ericsson was deliberately given the, the contract for our numbers portability administration center. Okay. And what's so that stop there for, for those that don't speak tech, explain what exactly that is, what it entails. So the Numbers Portability Administration Center is a separate entity from the United States, but what it is, is it, it controls porting your phone number as well as porting your IP address. So any numbers that are digitally in, input into a system, this is the center that will take your number or your IMEI from your cell phone, basically connects you to the cell tower or connects you to where you want to go online. Um, and so when you're calling to 911, this is the center that handles that process. So before anyone else gets access to your data, this center has open carte blanche backend access to all of our data. So um, when you're thinking of like a, like a neural network or, or, you know, I'm trying to think of the right terminology because I'm not a tech person, but I'm thinking about, um, let's call it an intricate web. Yep. data points just everywhere because you've got information that's personal to me because I have a phone, mm -hmm. you have a phone, everyone has a phone and you've got this, this, this information, this network. It, it seems like you'd have many, many opportunities to do more with that than just call 911. Um, earlier on, you mentioned elections, right? And we found out in Arizona, for instance, that uh, one of the reasons why Maricopa County refused to turn over routers and Splunk logs is because they were also basically on the same networks with 911 and emergency services. And so they, they raised that as a privilege. So uh, I, I'm thinking just out loud on, on the integration between all this information, but it doesn't just stop with a 911 call. It actually can go much further. Am I right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, the, the amount, so just to put it plainly, Ericsson and Huawei have had a patent sharing agreement since before 2000, on record since 2000. Um, Ericsson and Saudi Arabia just signed a patent sharing agreement a couple of months ago. Hmm. Ericsson and Apple, after, I mean, imagine that, right? After it's come out that Ericsson has bribe sponsored and funded ISIS multinational corporations are still like, Hey, yeah, let's partner up with these guys. I mean, in what world you won't support the war in Ukraine, you, you God forbid the Russians, but Holy cow. Yeah. We'll work with uh, people who sponsor and fund ISIS. I mean, it's yeah. And let's, let's pause right there because <laughs> geez, when we talk about, I mean, in the election space, anyway, we've talked a lot about foreign interference. And the reason why foreign interference is brought up is because of the executive orders that were signed by, by Trump back in 2018. And it looks like this is as, as, as de facto proof of foreign interference in an actually very tangible way. We're not talking about, you know, beaming in hacks or anything. We're talking about the receipts Oh yeah. You've got contractual partnerships with people that are allied with real recognized terrorist groups that are completely against US interests. And yet once again, we don't seem to get any coverage from 
anyone in the snake news legacy media. So let me ask you this, Michael. I mean, the, the, the fact that we're having this conversation, I'm, I'm honored to have it, but I'd like to think that bigger names should be interested in what you've had to share. Are there a list of names that you've brought this to and people were initially going, hey, I want to hear everything you have to say? I will. I will just name the uh, the entities and organization. Um, you have Fox News. You have several of the. Actually, I promised. I promised yesterday, uh, Mark Fincham, that I would that I'd give these last three uh, news organizations one more chance. Um, so, so I told him I'd compile a a three paragraph, um, you know, rundown. The, the the problem becomes, people don't understand that. The, Title 47 and the 1996 Telecommunications Act was signed in cyberspace by Bill Clinton. The excuse for that act was to protect children's privacy online. So where this Erickson report has led has obviously become much, much darker. And I think we'll probably unpack that maybe later on. But, but for now, just to give you an idea, the vote is way beyond stolen. Um, the, our country, our justice system, our, every function of government that you see as, as America has been hijacked. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, there's bad people in bad places. I mean that in the sense of we, when the towers fell, you had news. So there's three companies that, it, it, and this is, I think, part of why, telling the story uh, about the Erickson report becomes so uh, hyper difficult because you have like, I mean, it's not too difficult. You maybe, maybe 10 names of companies that you need to somewhat have a, a grasp on. But the four main ones are Newstar, Telcordia, Erickson, obviously. Um, and then the last one is Warburg Pincus. So when at the same time in 2011, Warburg Pincus happens to own Telcordia Technologies, which Telcordia is the name of the submarine cables that British mil military intelligence actually created. They created the Telcordia cables. Um, so you have Warburg Pincus in one point in 2011, and I think this is on page 16 or might be 15 of the report. But this one company is firm uh, created by Eric Warburg, whose brother Paul Warburg, who came together and created the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, but to continue on, in one year late in 2011, Warburg Pincus happens to create the initial funding and create the initial uh, proprietary uh, rights to CrowdStrike, Newstar, and they own Telcordia. So Telcordia and Newstar have been companies all since their inception, all the way back to Lockheed Martin, um, Telcordia all the way back to AT&T. And for some odd reason, this one firm that does a lot of business in Asia and uh, that loves to work with the Ford Foundation and that definitely does not have an allegiance to this country, um, considering one of the people who signed the Federal Reserve Act was a German, uh, you know, foreign national. Um, so, so when you get it, when you get an understanding of the, who these people are, when I say these people, these Warburg Pincus, they're the same organization, Eric Warburg, who owned American IG and IG Farben overseas, right? These, that's, that's the companies that provided the gas for the gas chambers during the Holocaust. Uh, these are the same people who funded the concentration camps, forcing the labor of the people to build the telecommunication cables, to build the uh, railway lines to take their gold and silver away from them, force them to work. And you're, it's just what, what it was is essentially, you know, socialist, so, socialist Marxist communism, taking people, displacing them, you know, moving their cultures around. They used IBM computers, which is an American company, to mark the arms, uh, you know, of, of the individuals, you know, during that time. Um, they used AT&T telecommunications cables. AT&T actually set up Hitler's uh, telecommunications phones. So for a time, you had Hitler and the, com you know, the communist state and, and uh, Soviet, Soviets, uh, the Soviets as well, had better telecommunications set up than 
did the Americans than did the, the allies. Um, of course, the reason why all of this correlates is because these are all the very same people who create and conceive the Federal Reserve Act and are involved in the First Bank of New York, um, which is tied to the Manhattan Company, which Donald Trump actually owns the building that holds a 200 year lease on the Manhattan company. It's called 40 wall street. Yeah, I want to stop you there. Cause right now my, my head's about to explode uh, <laughs> for, for a lot of different reasons. I'm following you because uh, one, one of the things that I actually wrote my, my long paper on uh, when I got my, my doctorate was on whether or not the federal reserve had ever received a meaningful audit. So I went back and did basically a hundred years analysis of of audits and the answer to that is not there's no meaningful audits they've got some token audits that don't show anything but you know there's a lot that you're throwing around right now and so what i want to do is kind of get us back to center back to center okay gotcha and and we'll unpack some more but you are sitting on all kinds of information that that not only is it relevant to the here and now you're seeing the same kind of players throughout history, team evil, if you want to call it, whether yes. you know, and, and we've seen different iterations of how evil can rebrand itself. So when we think of AT&T, we don't think of Hitler. When we think of, you know, Volkswagen, we don't think of the Nazis yet. A lot of these, these power players, when you're talking about the, the, the barons of old, the people that own the railways, the people that had uh, the, the most Wealthy men and women in the world always, always establish control over vectors of communication. Yes. Trade. Yes. Shipyards. And, yes. And, and those people don't go away. And so we need to think of like a like a giant squid with many, many uh, tentacles that go out and they they touch everything. And wherever there's power and influence that tentacle has to find its way to that area, grow, insulate, create even greater density of power. And it's the same families, it's the same corporations, and it's usually the same matrix of this labyrinth of corporate shells Yes, that make it so difficult to see who's really doing what and why. And so the question that I was um, asking you is that I, I know in the scheme of things, I'm a nobody. In, in, no, come on. Well, no, I mean, I'm a nobody in, in the scheme of things when you really know, you know, me versus a Tucker Carlson, for instance. Ah. Me versus, and what, what I'm saying is that this story is so important, yet you had an opportunity to take it to Fox. It looked like Fox was at least playing uh, a little bit of. Uh, oh, they wanted to play ball. They wanted to play ball. But you get a sense that maybe they want to play a ball to to take something, pivot it, maybe distort the truth, or maybe not get the real story. No, it's it's it was just their it was their attorneys. I mean, there was one point uh, for one one host. We went out to Virginia. They were ready to set up to have, bring car uh, trucks to pick us up, um, and they canceled like very last minute. That's their lawyers, you know. No, so, no, but but I I think it's it's. I, obviously that's true but what i what i'm telling you is i think that there are many hosts that maybe they're conveniently being um compartmentalized in a way where they do what they do very well yeah and there's no denying that their voice has an unspeakable reach so when i talk about a tucker carlson the fact of the matter is if tucker T carlson did a segment with you like we're doing right now yeah there would be massive reverberations through the world because his reach is that great now absolutely at some point if tucker's aware of this and it's a national security issue there needs to be a discussion within fox the internal rank saying i don't care what the attorneys say i guess the the, the larger question that i i'm i'm driving towards is obviously the attorneys the corporate heads of fox are saying no this is bad for business because if you look too deep, maybe we're implicated into this. I mean, because when you start talking about advertisements, advertisers, you're talking about three or yes. four news corporations that basically, you know, have different mm -hmm. shells down downstream that give us our news. Everyone at some point, if you look close enough, is going to look like 
they're part of the problem, right? Yep. And and that's the beauty of it is is I've designed this report. I mean, there's probably research for maybe 30 reports, right? This is really, truly, genuinely just the tip of the iceberg. And the only reason why I haven't put out more information, I'm going to be putting out a very huge thread today um, on Twitter. Um, but the reason why I've held back on putting this information out there is ex exact, exactly that. We could make our way. I Again, we, ha we have to come together. And, I, and it, it, it sounds so egotistical to say, oh, everyone needs to come together around this rapport I worked on. Right. But that's not what I mean. What I mean is everybody needs to come together and protest against. All right. This week we're going after this corporation. Right. And we're going to protest either outside or at this corporation's headquarters until they either receive the report, sign off on receiving it or agree to have me on to talk about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because this is what you do in America. Right. When something isn't suiting what you, what your interests are and it's it's infringing on your rights um it's it's causing you distress harm it's actually you know psychological distress and and more than that um you have to force the change right and, and that, that's what's with with uh, respect to corporations um people of course you have to respect their time the, their wishes the way they choose to go through ebbs and flows and you know there you, you can take a horse to water but you can't force it to drink corporations are not the same right corporations are soulless and they only care about themselves so while we spend a lot of time focusing on the government we are failing to realize that the government has become so corporatized so privatized so partnered up with every single law firm and every single defense contractor on the planet that it is like you said the kraken an octopus that's tentacles will reach you no matter where you go mm -hmm. it's very design is conceived to make sure you do not escape its grasp because well, it needs to control you and i think the response and, and this is the beauty of of liberty is that i've all i've maintained that our, our greatest strength as a country is our individualism, because it makes it allows us to be nimble, but there's there's weakness, there's pros and cons to that, you know. So you know, if if you have a centralized authority, right? If you can strike the head of, of the central authority, you basically can defeat an enemy. And I think one of the reasons that makes you know a resistance just that is that if you've got a bunch of independent spirit, uh, you know, that are just waging war the right way they're really hard to defeat because there's just too many. So for every tentacle out there, I think of an American, one American, and then two Americans, and then maybe a thousand Americans, and then a million Americans that can do battle with these different tentacles. Because as many tentacles as there are, there are, there are tens and tens of millions of, of Americans that care about this country. They care about the truth. And so what I'm hearing from you, Michael, is that this report is basically uh, something that we all need to chew on for a while to get our bearings about, one, just how deep the swamp is, how deep our problems are. Um, in many respects, yeah, your work reminds me of what Garrett Ziegler has done with the, with the Hunter Biden report. He's got a definitive report on just the Biden laptop. And you've got this yeah. definitive report that gets down to foundational security architecture for everything that we do in this country. And yeah. I try, I tried to keep it to just, uh, you know, 20, 25 pages. Though. So, uh, and there's a lot of pictures and like images in between. So it, it really isn't a difficult read as much as it is informational digging after, after the fact. But to me, that's like a treasure hunt, right? Um, and, and it's like a treasure hunt to save America, right? And so my, my, my call to action and my call to others, yourself, and anyone that, could, that would be listening to this is to let you know that I need help. And I, I, you know, I cannot do this on my own. And despite whatever flaws that I know I have, and the, you know, at times uh, inability to properly express to uh, the average individual what it is that I'm seeing, um, I just know that in my heart, 
this is so, so, so important. And it's not just in my heart that I know this. I've met with General Flynn on multiple occasions. I've met with uh, several admirals over the phone who I can't say, uh, you know, the, 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 their contact. But uh, I've met with colonels. I've met with attorneys. I have gone to the Arizona State Senate and testified. Um, I, I'm working to connect with Jim Jordan to testify before the next session of Congress, but they can't figure out who's going to be the, the House Speaker, you know, much less what's even going on there. But the reason why that's so important is because none of the WikiLeaks cables have ever been allowed to enter congressional record, meaning Hillary's emails have never entered congressional record. So you wonder why no congressman or no senator has ever read off one of Hillary's emails. The reason is because they've never actually been allowed to enter them into record. The day that Julian Assange was arrested, the United States Patent Office proprietized the news. It proprietized the data that WikiLeaks was, was traveling on. So the servers and the information that, that uh, WikiLeaks had on its website, when that data leaves WikiLeaks, it, it is no longer WikiLeaks data. It's data traveling from WikiLeaks to connect your device to their website. So all, all US federal workers, every agency, CIA, DIA, and I'll send you this letter so you can put it up. Uh, it specifically notes, if you even open these WikiLeaks cables, not only will you be fired, but we will sue you as well. These cables, even though they're newsworthy, even though WikiLeaks is a publisher and either, even though they've been published, they are still classified, which is a lie, right? Flat out lie. It's not that they were classified, it's that they were proprietized. So <clears throat> what ended up happening, and it was actually going on a little bit before the WikiLeaks cables, it goes back to 2000, 2001, um, when, when uh, New Star took over number portability. People have to, uh, or I need to do a better job of explaining how important portability is. Because you have your intellectual property, but then you also have your IP address, internet protocol, right? Those are all ports, just like the dock at the edge of a New York Harbor is a port, right? And those ports operate under admiralty law right so <clears throat> we won't go that deep into it today but uh the the point that i'm getting at is that this foreign swedish telecommunications company that is not a defense contractor they are not contractually obligated to this country they cannot be foiled they can they have no allegiance to this country yeah. right so this and is this is something terrorism. that this is um, so if I were going to give people the crayon version, like I get done with this interview, I go someplace and I want to enjoy a nice cheap bourbon. And someone said, Hey, wh what's on your mind, brother? I just had this conversation with Mike Corey. Who's that? He, he's the person that put out the Erickson report. Well, what's that about? If I had to distill what I'm hearing thus far, that you've got a, a major telecommunications entity out there, that has aligned itself with terrorists. Okay. And Huawei. And, and, yeah. But so, so point number one, you've got a, a blatant aligning of U.S. corporations doing business globally, of course, that are sponsoring and supporting terrorist organizations that seek the end of our way of life in America. Point number one. And then the point one, and then I'll give you the kicker too, because I, I, I should have definitely run through the biggest points, which is my fault. Um, but the Justice Department, the State Department, the IRS, the SEC, the DIA, and the CIA all knew. And in, in the report, you'll see the letters where they knew, because it shows you these letters, these letters they wrote to Erickson saying, hey, you're doing business in these state uh, sponsors of terrorism countries, Sudan, Libya, Iran, um, Iraq, you need to, you need to be putting this on your SEC forms, 
right? So there were some good people throughout these industries at these times, some of them, right? They, they were doing their job. Problem is Hillary Clinton comes out, that, uh, that wonderful woman, she comes out as Secretary of State and announces one week after her husband gets his most expensive payment for the Clinton Foundation, <clears throat> he gets paid $750,000 to do a speech in where? Hong Kong, China, mm -hmm. the same city that Snowden leaks his cables. Now, after he receives the $750,000, a couple of months after that fact, Hillary gets donations from VeriSign, ICANN, DocuSign, uh, AT&T, all almost every telecommunications company you can think of right what people have to come to the understanding of is when barack obama made the changes that he did destroying our country uh, from the inside out he actually made it so that corporations can not only support their favored political uh decision or political opponent or whatever after the supreme court ruling um, citizens united what that made it was that you could politically align with the DNC or the RNC, right? So you could literally infiltrate the DNC through memorandums of understanding that form a cohesive partnership between yourself and that entity. This is the inauguration represented the beginning of his second term. Yes. But it also represented the countdown of the end of his presidency. That's right. And the reality is, uh, like anything else, you better get what you can while he's there because, look, come 2016, that's it. Well, you know, I don't know, and I think some people are missing something here. The president has put in place an organization that contains the kind of database mm -hmm. that no one has ever seen before in life. That's going to be very, very powerful, and whoever... In terms of the Organizing for America that he's now shifting to become a 501c4. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that database will have information about everything on every individual in mm -hmm. ways that it's never been done before. And whoever runs for president on the Democratic ticket have to deal with that. They're going to have to go down with that database and the concerns of those people uh, because they can't get around it. And he's been very smart. I mean, it's very powerful what he's leaving in place. And I think that's what any Democratic candidate is going to have to deal with. How often are you communicating with the president? So now, if everyone donates to the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Foundation funnels that money from one place to another, it's like a circle of the corrupt life. It's right? like it's like an, an, an incestuous demonic pool. I mean, those yes. are the words. It's, it's just every everything that you're saying. It's like, my goodness, the, the, like evil does not sleep. And, and no. so like if, if I was going to continue this conversation at the bar too that people like Michael Corey have put people on notice that this is a problem yet because you've got swamp creatures like Hillary Clinton, they have either tried to sign off on executive orders or change the law to basically protect, you use the word uh, 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 proprietary. So basically maybe not mm -hmm. classification, but what you can do is use the private corporate entity, the private corporate entity, and use that as um, a shield a of shield. sorts. Yeah. Because at that point, FOIA really doesn't have any application. And, mm -hmm. and so one way to insulate yourself is to use the corporate umbrella. And whenever it's convenient, say, hey, we're not the government. We're a private corporate entity. We don't have to disclose these things under your, your sunshine law. So you've got a concealment element. And then the third thing that's unspoken thus far in this interview is that from a standpoint of enforceability or going after people uh, to to get some sense of justice, you have to have a sense of, well, where, where does jurisdiction start and stop? And um, there, when you're talking about cyber, you're talking about yes. networks, Yes. Where in the world do you even start to go after these bad guys? It's it's like someone designed the perfect environment for the swamp yes. to go back and forth. So maybe talk yes, about that. Yes, you nailed it. You have nailed it. And that was where I was going to be going with it. I'm so glad that you got it. So they have not, I'm going to take off this watch because it keeps binging. Um, but yes, so, so 
it, they've created this wonderland, right? The internet. And so when, when Bill Clinton signs that 1996 Telecommunications Act, it takes Title 47 and it puts it in full effect, not just here, but all over the internet. Now, to just give you an idea of how sick and twisted these people really are, they are using a kid's domain designed, and I'll show, and I'll send the documents so that you can put it, put it up on the screen. New Star controls a kids.us domain. This is the NPAC, that's Numbers Portability, Portability Administration Center, right? That is the entity and organization that operates these different levels of domains. So think of it as an attorney, you should really, this should really click with you. Um, you understand that when someone reports a mother or reports a father or parents to CF, DFS or uh, CPS, right? Mm -hmm. And then the state comes, what does the state have jurisdiction of? Well, typically it's, you're, you're, you're looking at the physical location of, of where the complaint has been um, lodged. So the only way that a law enforcement person would even be there to begin with is if he happens to live in the same physical jurisdiction or physical location as, as wherever the complaint was lodged. But, but, uh, but I guess the, the, the question, the, the, the direction I, I was, I was meaning to go was in 1998, Bill Clinton passes a children's online privacy act. And through this 2002 additional uh, act, uh, the dot kids domain efficacy act, this is where they're able to say, while parents have sole custody and jurisdiction as it applies to the child off the internet, when it applies to on the internet, on devices, the government has an interest in, in their psychological and moral well being. So, what that means is when the State Department goes after, you know, uh, parents to take their kid away. They only have to get the report. They don't even have to investigate to, to verify that the report is true. They can literally go to a, a uh, kindergarten or go to the school of where the child is, is at, and they can t take the child from that school and, and take them to the center. I see. Now, so, so the basically, uh, maybe I was confused by the question, but the, the report itself basically serves as a rubber stamp probable cause statement you know and that's really all you need in order to to arrest or seize someone as yes. a probable cause and so if you've got this report that's just generated from whatever whatever source that seems to be sufficient it's it's actually very reminiscent of kind of our rubber stamp system with uh, FISA where <laughs> yes you can you can which this all that. ties back to as well all right so let, let me let me just see if we can bring this back to center once again. You've got yeah. this this port site that 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 Clinton set up. In the grand scheme of things, why is that important? Because we're talking about aligning with. I mean, I know it's it's important on a on a on a micro level. I'm not sure that I understand, or maybe I just want to make sure I'm not missing the significance on the larger story that you're sharing with me. So all of all of the CIA's data all of MI6's data, every spying apparatus around the world's data um, is running through New Star, Amazon Web Services, and back up to Ericsson. So Ericsson, if you want to know where Hillary's emails are, Ericsson. If you want to know where uh, the JFK files are, Ericsson, New Star, right? If you want to know why Barack Obama made his, became the first digital president, and why his library is so different from every other presidential library and why they're putting the onus so much so on Donald Trump because they're saying, oh, well, Donald Trump's going to end up having to do the same thing. Well, no, he's not because Donald Trump made everything public for the most part. Um, the difference is Barack Obama, when I've done the research and the data and I can send you the threads that I put out, Barack Obama, his foundation is actually employing its own private uh, archive. Now, archives are not a public library, right? A library is public. Library is accessible to all. Well, 
for some odd reason, the domains that lead back to the Barack Obama uh, Ameritech email that he had, which is an AT&T email, which he had as a senator in 2008 through the WikiLeaks cables, that email address, when I do the forensics uh, results on it, ties back to NARA, right, which is the National Archives. That also ties back to the Obama Foundation, right? So the LBJ Library also ties back to it. And if you remember, once JFK was assassinated, LBJ took over JFK's term. So it's a very, very, very uh, deeply entrenched story, but it's all backed with forensics data and it's all backed with DNS uh, proof and uh, intelligence. So the reason why, why Erickson is so important is because if we let them get away with this after the Justice Department has already fined them a billion dollars in 2019, they delayed the investigations. So, they, so our government knew that Erickson was doing this business with terrorists. The uh, State Department knew. Um, then I forgot to tell you after the $750,000, Hillary comes out and says, we're going to give Erickson a pass. We're not going to sanction telecoms like Erickson. We're going to allow them to police themselves. And then a year and a half later, they win the, uh, they win the award to take over our 911 emergency services. So wow. everything. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's another drop. Like, you know, it's, it's funny when um, all of a sudden people like Hillary Clinton are all about the free market. Let, let, let yeah. these, these companies police themselves, uh, police themselves in a way that they'll never, you know. Never come showcase, after us. <laughs> yeah, showcase my, my dirt. Okay, so Michael. Um, there's so much that where we go, we can go from here because I know like Tucker finally came out on part of, you know, the release of JFK information where you've got admissions that the CIA was involved in the assassination oh, yeah. of, of, no of Kennedy. Now, mo most of us already knew that, but it was just nice to get a bit of, of affirmation. Um, LBJ is one of these people, the more that you know about him, the guy was like just demon possessed filth. Um, we look at the security detail, much didn't make sense about um, travel routes, security protocols. Um, I don't know if this is still the case, but there's a time in, in my research of the Federal Reserve that, uh, that's, that stood out to me was some of the security being provided uh, to the Federal Reserve and to the, to the White House, the president. Um, was the Secret Service. I thought it was Secrets. odd yeah. that those yeah. two, and it really shows you that the Federal Reserve, if if that's the case, really seems to be the kind of power center behind a myriad of of of, of different things. You know, so um, you've got the bankers, and yes. when you look at donation trails to your most preeminent politicians or campaigns, it's usually the same ten banks. And they don't care. You can look at the donors to Romney versus Obama. They hedge their bets. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can charge interest on domestic welfare as much yep. as you can charge interest on rebuilding embassies in the Middle East. And what's wonderful about, not wonderful, what's terrible, wonderful for them in the midst of crisis and chaos, that if you have any defaults, if you have anything that falls falls apart, they get to collect the physical assets of ruin. So yes. in war torn countries, either you're going to make money on interest or you're basically going to seize physical assets, which as we know is usually much more valuable than anything else. And so you've got this system in place since 1913 of a constant legalized cover to shift debt, markets to, to, yeah. to create massive amounts of indebtedness of we the people. Uh, to basically figure out ways to tax us in every single uh, way imaginable, because you also had the passage of the Federal uh, Income Tax Act the same year. You also had the passage of the 17th Amendment, which changed the way that uh, we, we voted our U.S. senators, so they weren't even looking out for the sovereignty of we the people. All right. that, that stuff happened over 100 years ago, and we've seen these incremental losses um, booms and busts all the way until we get to to now and we're we're on this precipice of our money's, our money's just funny there's there's nothing to it 
uh, you know, and um, I think many of us have been waiting for a, a collapse. I mean, I've been waiting for a collapse since the 2000s. Anyone that's that's followed, say, the work of of Ron Paul or 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 Peter Schiff and people that actually looked at the housing bubble of 2008, we're sitting there going, when when are we going to have an account? accountability? Yeah. And here we are. It's like thirty trillion dollars, and people are still acting like. Well, ask yourself exactly. We're never going to pay that. Off. Ask yourself this, though, Professor. How come with all of these corporate crimes, most of which are done cyber or over the internet, right? Uh, transactions, right? Swift transactions. Those happens over happen over telegraphs, analog. Um, and some, you know, now it's digital, but, you know, in the beginning, way back when I'm talking, you know, we're, we're, they, were, they were analog. So ask yourself this, if the transactions are happening in a cyber space, is it a wonder why since Bush senior came into power, sealed away the records, and they already knew at that time that cryptography was a huge thing. John Podesta was actually heading up the head of crypto cryptography uh, conferences mm -hmm. with all the tech companies. This goes all the way back then. And so they sealed all those records away, right? Through the John J. F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy Presidential Records Act of 1992 or three, I can't remember the exact year. Um, but the point of this, this uh, that point that I'm making here, if you look at the federal debt, right? Since Bush senior, it ballooned after the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Because yeah. if I'm able to send money from, let's say we have $2 trillion, right? But in China, the bank is only open from such and such hour to such and such hour, right? Well, if you have better technology that can move quantum financial systems quickly, you know, and, and the name of Soros is very early fund, like in like the 90s was the quantum fund, mm -hmm. right? So if you're moving money from a district or a part of the world or time zone where those banks are closed, then they don't need that money. So you move the money to a bank that is open, right? And then when the fraud alert hits, uh oh, we, we need we need to cover those funds. They are there by the time the the person goes to actually investigate it. Yep. So that's just the tip of it, right? You have you have the higher up, the upper echelons that literally abuse the escrow and tax refund system through the mortgages. Um, none of them pay a mortgage. There's a reason why they all have a mortgage, um, and that's to abuse the tax system and make everyone on the bottom pay more. Yeah. Uh, the, the beauty of doing this report and the beauty of being in the, in the mortgage industry is that I have mortgage data that I took from these companies, but I took it in such a way that it was legal. Um, they gave me at-home access, and from the at-home access, I positioned my home security camera right above my computer. So technically, I didn't take any data from the company, right? I was just making sure that my personal space and what I was doing while working on their systems was being protected and monitored. Mm. So this is this was not in their contracts. And once I, I basically outsmarted them. Um, but this is also the thing that Julian Assange knows about Bank of America that he doesn't want to reveal because he knows the second that that gets revealed, they will take him out. Um, well, he seems like he's he's been on a. Um, it seems like there's been reasons to take out Assange for like the longest the longest time and, and i'm not saying that's a good thing i'm just saying that whatever it is that he knows he, you know we can speculate on how many receipts he he, he holds uh, we can speculate on on some of those you know reasons why he wasn't pardoned i mean that's the, that's a question that comes up quite a bit when you i think I, th I think for me right when you look at when, when you think of the term pardoned right what is that what does it really mean it means that you're being um, forgiven, right? Or, or uh, you're, you're for something you did wrong. Yeah. Right. So I don't know if there's an admittance of uh, admittance of guilt there, um, but but I would I would suggest to believe if there was any shred of any idea that that Julian would have had to admit guilt, that's why there there wasn't a deal done. I know well, people. That's, like a, that's to, a good point. I I think what we're we're looking at is. Um, most of the people 
that require pardons now are actually factually innocent of any, any <clears throat> moral crime. It's just that what we've done is we've created um, legal traps, you know, like Edward Stone, for instance. Right. You know, if, if you look at, you know, his conduct, did he violate his security agreement? Yes. Is that illegal? Yes. Is it immoral? No, because right. the security agreement was ran contrary to the Fourth Amendment. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where like you're in some ways, I guess the utility of the pardon is is nothing more than to to, to avoid future prosecution. But even now, the Department of Justice is looking for for ways to to circumvent that and still go after people. They were looking at, at doing that with uh, with Steve Bannon. So, it, you know, obviously, if you're a threat and you're a tyrant, you're going to do whatever it takes to shut people up with. And if you've got control of the uh, Department of Justice, uh, the FBI, they got control of everything. It really doesn't matter if you if you got the pardon. Um, but for but this, yeah, what, I guess my point is is that Assange, for the longest time, is he's been around so long, yet we haven't gotten any finality to his story. I mean, it's like he's it's tragic when you think about it. It's just absolutely it, tragic. His story is our story. Because without his actions, we would not know about any of this, hmm. right? We wouldn't know about the corruption. You know, we'd know about the Federal Reserve, we'd, you know, things, ins and outs like that. But I mean, the amount of data that is in, within those WikiLeaks cables, the part of the reason why, you know, the intelligence agencies around the world had to go into literally like, it's us, it's all of us versus them. Like, that's the mode that they're in right now. They're all pointing the finger at each other. Everybody has access to everybody's data. And that's very dangerous, by the way. Uh, but what I will say to, to keep it positive, because I think that's where this needs to go. This is our opportunity to stick our boot right into this apparatus's eye, right? Right onto its neck and just finally stomp down, right? And, and I'm not saying harm anyone, right? I'm not saying, uh, you know, do anything physical. I'm saying with this knowledge, with this information, they're not going to, they will not allow this information out. I can tell you that without a shadow of a doubt. They, they can place frequency gates. Um, the, the queen, or not queen, the king of England can say, Michael Corey is a matter, he, he's harming the national security of my throne. So because of that, because we're allies, I need you to put a frequency gate around all of my United Kingdom countries, which is very interesting. And you'll see and you'll notice that very rarely on Twitter will I ever connect with anyone from any of those countries, right? Um, it's, by, it's by design. So the point that I'm getting at is we now have an opportunity to not only show the truth, but through today's thread, I show the connection to the specific law which they abused and the exact date that they abused it. And it's a house law under title 47, section 230. And it is, it has to do with the national archives, but it also operates on this kid's domain. Um, suddenly on January 13th of 2021, the day that the house impeaches Donald Trump, all of these 47 USC 902 and 941 laws which when you go and look further into them i i, I think we, you're, you and i should definitely look at them afterwards i've been trying to find attorneys who had a little bit of time to just look and like help me understand what i was seeing a few of them did and they were like yeah this this is what this is it right here this is what you're talking about fincham did, did that as well that's why he was like dude put this together and i'm sending it over this is what will free donald trump because what they did was they used admiralty and maritime law through Title 47, and they did it on a kid's domain, a domain that is exclusive only to children under 13. Have you ever heard of such a of such a thing? I'm not so I'm not even sure I I understand what what all that means. I mean, Michael, just just be honest with you. It's just um, I'm trying to put on my the the bad guy hat. Think like, of it like a li like a library, right? There's yeah. a section of the library where only kids can go. Only children are allowed in that library, mm -hmm. right? But who's, who, who, who oversees that library? Mm -hmm. The State Department. Yeah. So when you think about it, you know, there's, there's child and there's parent patents. I learned this through my research. 
I did not know that that was the case, but apparently there's a child iteration of patents and then there's a parent iteration of patents. And then you have your attorney who signs off on the patent and then you have the patent assignee and then you have the patent uh, inventor. <laughs> so it's like all of these different layers of protections. But when you're talking about a child patent, the way that the state looks at the information and the data is that they are always, it's a national security risk, right? The well being and the mental state of the child. So that also applies to patents and proprietary aspects of, of uh, uh, IP. I know that sounds insane, but you have to remember these people are twisted. Yeah. They're sick. So, so okay. we'll, we'll go over it more in the future, but, but it is very, very relevant and very well, important. Well, let's, let's, let's see what we can do because what I'd like to do is we'll continue to have, um, I hope, an ongoing yeah. conversation. But based on what we've covered today and, um, and uh, you know, just, just trying to be cognizant of if – We've got a viewer watching this. You use this word hope. I want to end on a word of hope. What is your hope um, for the future? And I think that I could maybe further break break this down in, into two different questions. One's a little bit more personal. Your hope for what will be done with this report, and just maybe our country going forward, because a lot of us are tired, right? We're all yeah. kind of in this this season of. Man, 2023's got to be different than 2022. It, just, oh, it, has to be. it has to be. And then the personal question is, um, what's motivating Michael to stay in the fight? Uh, so to answer the first question, I 100% can identify every single day I go through struggles, right? And that's why there's prayer. That's why there's meditation. That's why there's uh, a higher power that you defer to at times. Um, but I think what, what will be so beautiful is once we come to this point here in 2023, it's going to be a completely different year because we have not only figured out what these people have done, but we've actually cornered them into their little uh, boxes and, and they've actually, in, in a lot of ways, if you think of it like a Mongol horde, uh, they, they, they went into the balloon, right? So they all funneled in and now they're stuck. All we got to do is tie the, tie the little, uh, you know, tie the, tie the balloon shut. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a, a, a quick analogy, but, but I truly do mean that. This report will lead to Ericsson and its corruption within the government, we will lead to the connections to China and Russia. Um, and I know I'm kind of hyperemphasizing, but if you just go and take a look at the report on plusultra.org, I'm not asking for anything from anyone. Um, I, I just, I want this country to restore the Republic. I want us to come back to a place because, because it, it affects my family overseas in, in Lebanon. And that's part and parcel as to why I did the report. Uh, my, my parents looked at me and said, don't you do it. Don't you put that report out. Because you, you here in America, yeah, you have protections. Over in Lebanon, your, your grandmother and your grandfather and your family, they are being controlled by a government that is, is operated by Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah. Those are actual terrorists. Mm -hmm. And you're putting a report out that unravels the, the, the means and ways by which they make money. Uh, the bank in, in Lebanon failed in, two, in 2019, so all my cousins can't access any of their funds. Two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. They can't access it. Uh, they haven't been able to since 2019. So what I would say is, in in those times where my family, uh, my parents are working every single day, nonstop overtime, so they send every dollar that they make overseas. Um, but the, the 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 point of hope that I have is, this is the apparatus. It's all it's all interconnected in one little web. And, and after I put my report out, two weeks after I put the report out, the SEC opened a new investigation into Ericsson. Now, whether that's another, you know, block and tackle scheme or whatever, it doesn't really matter. The, the point of the matter is we have some senators who have revealed the truth, like Ron Wyden, a Democrat. He put out a full four pager on Newstar and on NSO Group, basically verifying what I put in my report over seven, eight months ago. Um, and so what I, what I mean to say is the truth is out there. We need only to come together 
and curate and put together a plan for our, you know, operation of uh, execution. And, and once that's done, we don't need to utilize their cables or their frequencies or their any of the through human connection, right? If I can just call upon one person to go to their neighbor, to their police officer, to their firefighter, to the people who use these systems and say, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to, to, to drum up too much at your job. I'm not going to ask you to, to change your way of life or go fight the fire department. I do have one very close friend friend in uh, Arizona here um, who actually did. He, le- he completely left the fire department and get, call, called it quits. And he's uh, one of my one of my best friends. Um, you actually met. We went, we went to lunch with him. Um, but uh, those are th- those are the people. And that's I'm not saying we need to create a whirlwind where everyone quits their jobs. No, uh, what I'm saying is we have to stop supporting corporations that are literally demeaning and destroying humanity. Um, and one, one last point to, to before I get to the, the second question um, on on October 18th of 2022, Lafarge, a uh, materials company and cement company actually was charged and took the charge. Now, this is a cement company that's tied to CMEX. It's a French cement company that's supported terrorism as well. They were charged. With, that's so weird. It's such a small world. CMEX is a is a big deal. Connected to Hillary, right? And it's a big deal here in New Mexico. CMEX has well, got all kinds of, of, of quarries. Um, Geez, I, I wasn't expecting that, but I know quite a bit about CMEX. <laughs> well, well, I know there's there's tons of stuff in New Mexico we're going to get into, and I told you that. And I'm telling you, it has to do with DARPA, it has to do with the Atomic Energy Commission, it has to do with the Manhattan Project, and those archives are there. They're waiting for us for for us to go and actually access them, and we will. Um, but but the point about about Lafarge is Hillary Clinton worked on the board of Lafarge in ninety one, ninety and ninety one and ninety two. Um, and it came out, you know, that's where I grew up on the uh, Michigan Harbor. Um, it came out that Lafarge was materially aiding uh, terrorism. Now, what, what was their charge? Well, you had Loretta Lynch, Jay Johnson, and John Carlin prosecuting. They were all working for the same firm that, that approved the Erickson deal, Paul and Weiss. Now, this was October of 2022. What did they charge them with? They charged them with material aiding and abetting a terrorist organization, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. What was their charge? $768 million. In the grand scheme of things, that's a speeding ticket. It's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, so, it, it's it's just impressive enough for the, the lay person picking up a paper for 30 seconds to go, wow, look at that accountability. But it's nothing. No, no, no. It's nothing when we're talking. No, it's, about it's the worst because it's precedent. Now you yeah. set the precedent that you can, as a corporation, commit terrorism. And then if that's the case, now Erickson is like, oh, hell yeah, look at that. We, we just got this ruling yep. from Lafarge. Now we're going to get charged a couple billion. But what did we actually reap? 30, 40 billion. Yeah, and- it's, it's part of the, of the cost analysis of, of doing business. Like, you know, this might sh- shock some people, but um, companies like Oracle. They've got billion dollar litigation budgets. And then so they've got a vested interest to keep litigation going forever because they don't want finality on on uh, certain adjudications of of who owns what. As long as they can tie things up in the court, that's that's a victory. And so what you're talking about is like, yeah, you can have an SEC fine, you can have something over here that that sounds impressive, but in the scheme of things, they they have a a, a you know basically a, a book of cost inputs, outputs on what it takes to keep the machine going and it's nothing whatever whatever you take out of the ledger they're going to make it up through another laundering scheme yeah. another insider deal right moving wow. money from place to place but to, but to keep it with hope here's here's the point of hope we have caught them right and truth is all that matters at the end of the day and if I can, if I can figure out the truth, right, then that means that I can get assistance and hopefully get help in retelling and, you know, distributing this truth, because this story will unravel the Federal Reserve. It will unravel the history of what really went on during the Cold War. It will unravel the JFK files. It will also unravel why all these telecommunications companies have been interconglomerated and inter inter uh, co partnered um, all together? Wow. Well, well, 
there there's so many things that I I want to ask about and and it's probably if I ask another question, it'll probably <laughs> lead to another uh, hour long conversation. And, but let, let me, I am in a risk asking one question and this is kind of my tinfoil thing. I'm just wondering out loud. Many of us have the real president on our mind because, right. you know, you just can't observe and witness the theft of the Republic. Now we know that the thieving has been going on for 30 years plus, but it culminated and manifested itself in such an ugly, ugly way on November, November 3rd, 2020 to, to strip a duly elected, lawfully elected president of his legitimate position. So you've, you've put things together. Obviously you've got a, a you know, a strong, um, you know, mind, an aptitude to, to track very, very complex information. Yeah. Michael. I mean, I could, you just, I, I can, I can see that you're very comfortable with this and it's really quite nice to have this conversation because this is not a conversation I could have with, with most people. So right. uh, you got some horsepower up there. <laughs> do you, do you believe that people in the Trump administration have the horsepower to put this put this work that you've done, or perhaps they've done it in their own way and they just are waiting for the big reveal. I'm not looking for hopium, but is there anything that you've seen from the outside looking in from um, Team Trump that gives you hope on us getting our, our president back? I, um, I have hope that for humanity and that the right thing will be done. Um. I think it's going to take a, uh, a, a virtuoso, uh, masterful way of campaigning and coming together around the, the, the details that I'm, that I'm trying to extract and show to people. Um, because I know I can't do it alone, number one. But number two, when you're, you said it earlier, right? When you're so compartmentalized in your job and what you do, you're always going back up to who? The higher up to tell you what? how the system works, what to do, what you have to abide by. So when I point these things out to the experts or to the generals or to the admirals, you know what they tell me? Either you, you got this nailed, like so you are so over the target that uh, like, I don't even know how much I can have conversation with you because I've signed an NDA. Hmm. I've signed state secrets privilege. I've signed some sort of agreement somewhere to where I'm not able to extract this information. So when you come from a place where me, myself, I've done this open source, everything I've, I've put together is done 100% accessible on the internet, 100% verifiable intelligence. Um, when you do it in that form and fashion and you have no restraints, then you can speak. And you can say whatever it is that is going on with, and I have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. um, so if this, ex, you know, if this is going to expose the federal reserve, amazing, you know, now, now we get to bring in, I'm not saying destroy the entire financial system. What I'm saying is bring in accountability, right? Yeah. Remove the rats, remove the snakes, remove the, the, the virus, right? And then you're left with, uh, you know, amazing things. You're, you're left with a world that can begin again, uh, that can build upon itself and, and where we can actually uh, do what's best for the children and for humanity. Uh, and I think that's where the focus has been lost, right? It's like, let's just kind of kick, kick the tires. Uh, you know, they stole the election, they uh, put Biden in power. Yeah, they, they may have done all those things, but those things are what have identified their criminality. Well, let me, let me. Uh, that they've done wrong. I, I think that was a, a very, very intelligent answer. And I, I, I think my my hope for you, let me just say this out loud, is that if someone from the Trump team happens to watch this, I hope that in the campaign trail, that this conversation that we're having finds its way into those campaign stops where the Trump where Trump uses his influence. I mean, like 
one of the things that he did was just amazing was that that digital bill of rights policy that that he's proposing you know in light of all of the collusion that we're seeing because that has uh relevance to what you're talking about when you got Twitter did files. you know did you know the uh we were we were running the jerome campaign and we we actually were the ones who put out the internet bill of rights video that's um, wonderful we've been campaigning Jerome, that's on that right jerome three, dave three davidson right? yeah yeah we've been, we've been campaigning jerome. on that online for almost three to four years because obama did the same thing but he did one called the consumer privacy bill of rights mm -hmm. and so we'll, <laughs> there's so much there's so much information in this and and i'm telling you this first report the erickson report is mm -hmm. just the tip of the iceberg but it's the tip that i need help getting yeah. connected because i can't have a platform because i'm not allowed to build up any sort of following they literally put frequency gates on i mean i i can't even log into truth social from my phone Okay. Well, let tell you what, this is what we're going to do. I, I still have an account a few places, not everywhere, but uh, I think one call to action for folks that see this, if, you, if, if this interview resonates with you and we'll have links to the Erickson report, um, we're going to have all kinds of information that's, that's vital in the description box below, but tag Donald Trump, tag Donald Jr., tag the players out there, tag Elon Musk to see if we can get exactly. this discourse in Twitter. Because I'll tell you right now, unless we clean up house from you know the most basic foundational uh, places, you know I've been a pretty foundational person when it comes to the machines um, in the election space. This is just as foundational, if not more, because now you're talking about the kind of the circuitry, if you will. Yeah, where the files reside, where the data, yeah. where the data stays. Exactly. And so we're all getting a PhD in evil on just how <laughs> widespread the, the corruption is. And uh, every time you think you've, you've seen it all or heard it all, you have a conversation with Michael Corey and you're like, Oh God, <laughs> man, it's, it's, but, but it's even, it's not that like it's worse because we all kind of, kind of have this abstract black cloud of, yeah, it's a complete, shit show but when he talks about it with specificity and the how and the abstract actually becomes a little bit more concrete because you're like no oh, this okay. is what happened yeah. then it, it, you kind of have to just brace yourself for, okay what do we do with it so my my prayer for for michael is um one protection um he's been placed here for a particular reason uh to put this together in a way that we can understand. And, and it's been a wonderful conversation, Michael. And two, for those that do have the platforms, uh, whether that's the Tucker Carlson's or whether it's the real president, I sure hope that you guys will start talking about the significance of the Erickson report over the next two years, because I know this is going to be critical to any success that we have in getting our country back. So with that, Michael, um, I want to thank you for your time today and just ask you to uh, hopefully let's have another conversation in the future. Oh, we'll have plenty. Thank you so much for having me on. And, uh, you know, I, I do, I do want to leave everyone with a, a message of hope because uh, this truly is a, a spiritual battle, but, but it also is a battle where you're battling within, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of technologies that they're trying to deploy on humanity um, are, are of which are of the type which would allow them to play God. And when you know that and you're aware of it, and then you sit back and kind of say to yourself, eh, no big deal. You know, just, just for instance, for example, right. Uh, seeing children of today versus children of 20 years ago and the problems of a child of 20 years ago versus the problems of a child from today, you know, it's so drastically different. And that has something to do with the frequencies and with the 5G and the radiation and the effects on the body. So what I, what I will leave us with is we have an opportunity to destroy and shatter the apparatus by which humanity is being enslaved in shackles. Mm. The, the choice is ours and we get to choose. Do we want to put an end to this? Or do we want our oppressors to continue and and mm -hmm. and uh, bow down to them? That's... I love I love that message, and uh, one of the things that's been resonating with me is that we all need to become the great abolitionist of today. 
uh, slavery is taking a different form. We don't see the manacle. We don't see the chain around our legs or our arms. Yet we get up and we are going through the motions, folks. I mean, uh, I just happened to, to watch the Lincoln movie the other night. Um, that Spielberg. Amazing. Amazing movie. And when you, depending on how accurate the film is, there's no doubt that a, 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 a miracle had to happen to secure the votes, the way that they were secured, uh, leveraging the war, um, you know, talking out of both sides of your mouth, depending on who you're talking to, to just get to this place where you can not only emancipate and free people, but secure a future. And as a result of that effort, you had this thing called the 13th Amendment, right? Guaranteeing us that we would never, ever be subject to slavery ever again. And yet here we are in 2022, folks. I can't unsee the change that are around every one of us through these election machines, through the stuff that Michael's sharing with us today. Folks, we we are living in blatant violation of the 13th Amendment. So hats off to Michael um, as one of our fellow abolitionists. We need to end this, this, this slave trade. And here's another piece of the puzzle for us to ponder. So with that, Michael, God bless you. And here ends this you. episode of The Professor's Record. Thank you so much for having me. God James. bless everybody.